Hello there, my friends, and welcome back to the New Order, last days of Europe, in which we're playing as that great USA. We've got a few comments to get through, but we did end the last episode with the meeting event, in which we either say that sanctions are not to pacify Burnham down in Guyana and get the press to calm down, or tell Burnham to repeal the act or else. Uh, for a lot of fun, like, I looked up a couple of different pathways, because with the comments from yesterday, ev um, not everyone, but a lot of people told me to go with... Uh, RFK, Glenn, Yaki, LBJ, Gus Hall, so many different leaders, and I can't do all of them. I would love to, but there's one path that I want to try to get in my first campaign playing as the United States. Now, I promise I will play as America probably at least probably three more times on this channel in TNO, depending on how much content there is eventually. So, for now, in this campaign, we're going to go until Burnham to repeal the act or else. And eventually there's going to be a case of civil rights, which we need to be aware of. But we're giving our commitment to African democracy at the moment. And the media slams Nixon. Although President Nixon's sweeping electoral victory two years ago may prove that he once enchanted the American people. It seems that the magic that swept them into to the polls in 1960 is wearing off for many of them. And many of those people also happen to be journalists at nationally syndicated newspapers. Headlines riddled with pun-laden or laden insults seem to be everywhere. And titles like... Nixon needs fixin' or tricky dick in a pickle, and law, lawlessness, and disorder fill the newsstands. Their main source of ire is the rising tension of the civil rights movement in the South, specifically the president's inability to properly contain it. The man who once saved off nuclear Armageddon, or so would we would claim, now seems powerless to stop a bunch of student protesters and racist hoodlums from squaring off and his image is deteriorating as a result. And Nixon, who seems impish and anemic when compared to Vice President Kennedy's charm charisma, needs all the positive press he can get. All he can do for now is hope that they will eventually change their tune, although he cynically insists that the press has a grudge against him that they simply will not let go. They've got it, got it out for him. Yeah, they probably honestly do. Uh, so far, I still want to focus a little bit more on... Um, the economy, and probably to save as much political power. Yesterday, we had decision, decisions to boost popularity in different places here. We might stop. Maybe. Maybe not. We'll see what happens, because I, I really do have one campaign or one leader sort of idea in the end, because well, it seems kind of like a fun way to go. A really fun way to go with a person from this state. But anyways, actually, it's kind of weird that this state has all of this lake, Lake Erie. The polls are updated, though. Uh, let's see, we were this last time. Let's go check on, check, check in on the horse race. Very cool. Yeah, let's see. Uh, polls, let's see. Democrat, Republicans, center, center. Uh, RDs, 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 RDs. A lot of RDs, a toss-up in the Great Lakes in Illinois. Ooh. Uh, RDs, 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 a toss-up in North Carolina. NPP in the Deep South, I'm not even going to be really concerned about that. Toss-up in Pennsylvania, a toss-up in Vermont. But let's go and do some more of this. Let's see. Oh, we can't... We can do this. We can do the Kennedy plan for civil rights. Or we can do crackdown on the movement. Now, this definitely has severe implications for uh, later on. And have you seen this focus? Everyone I don't agree with is Hitler. Look at that. That's beautiful. Also, there was a comment from yesterday telling me that the reason why a lot of this, a lot of this is done already is because we're already halfway through Nixon's campaign. So that actually makes a lot of sense. That makes so much sense that I didn't realize that uh, wiretap the NPP... Uh, that this stuff is already done, so. Uh, for now, though, we were trying to do help out South Africa, protecting our interests. It also make it difficult to pull out if future events require it. Ooh. South Africa will make it easier to convince Americans to intervene. South Africa secured. Grows a little bit more unified for our party. I like that. I like more party unity versus domino. Let's go ahead and crack down on the movement. Let's give people reason to like us or hate us. The civil rights movement is proving to be a bigger threat to our stability than we could ever imagine. Maybe America needs change, but it'll only be when we deem it necessary, not at the whims of the mob. We lose political power, which we don't like. Nixon's plot, the progressives in the party may react poorly to our plan. It, rights? Who needs rights? No one needs rights. No one at all. Rights are a figment of the imagination. The loose cannon. Well, here we go again, Kennedy sighs, rubbing his temples. Haldeman looks over at the time. It's a bad way to start the day. He refused our offer, he says. The pressure didn't work. Burnham's a loose cannon. Nixon is looking thoroughly through one of the windows of the White House meeting room, ignoring the exchange behind him. Unlike yesterday, the presidential cabinet is not assembled in its near entirety. Only McNamara, Haldeman, Nixon, and Kennedy are in the boardroom. Well, McNamara says, I guess we gotta do it the hard way. Balls in your court, Jack. I'll make the call. Kennedy makes a move to get up, but Nixon raises a hand. Turning around, he scans his eyes over the room. Who says we have to do anything? Haldeman raises an eyebrow. Dick... He's executing people. We can't let this slide, not with the press on our back like they are now. 
Since when are we so high and mighty? Suppose we supported men like Burnham in the past, and even if we ignore this, we still have plausible deniability. I don't think this is a good idea, Kennedy says, placing a hand on Nixon's shoulder. I think we owe to the people of Guyana to help them. Haldeman looks over to McNamara, who shrugs. Gotta tell you, Bob, I agree with Dick on this one. Haldeman looks at Nixon. Nick, well, Dick, you're the president. And you know what? Just for fun measures, I wanted to put it. I put a division down here last time. These uh, aerial divisions, which look very, very cool. I'm gonna go ahead and retreat them and not click on this stuff. And yeah, and we're gonna have a good time in New Orleans because New Orleans is a nice place to be in May. Actually, it's very, very hot down there. Never mind. That's not very great place to be. Let's return our soldiers and put them around the port of San Francisco. Cool. Why not? Casually returning soldiers back home for no reason. Oh, good RD campaign. Good to hear. Well, I'm done with that, though. And let's see. We need to shut and burn him down. This is a slippery slope of disobedience, and we're going to deal with it. Cool. McNamara's right. The press will get over this in a few weeks. It's not that big of a deal. NPP's popularity grows a bit. Ooh. We need to shut and burn him down. It's not that big of a deal. Mm, you know what? How about... We need to shut them down. And let's say things don't go very well down there. And they run a lackluster campaign. If you want to read this, go right ahead. Um, this happened last episode, so I'm not going to read it. Fingers crossed. Nice. Hmm. We got to save that pee, pee Because this is not looking good. Oh, oh, look at that. GUI. Some purples, some purples. Not bad. Ah, the parties. GOP and Democrats are two sides of the same coin. Quite literally. Quite literally compared to the NPP. The National... What was it? Progressive Party? Populist Party. Progressive Party. Ooh. NPP. <laughs> the center of NPP. Far left, far right, and yuckies. Yeah. He doesn't have a focus tree yet. Someday, I promise, I'll play as him, though. Let's see. Anything here that we really care about? We don't have to campaign. Oh, I mean, we can, you know, we can try the Deep South, since we're not going to get it anyways. Nah, I'm not, we're not going to touch it. Nah, I'm not touching it. Nope. Nah, we have a very fun way, or fun thing that we can do. Oh, 214 billion. That helped a little bit. Ah, oh, the CIA report, South Africa. Secret. The situation and prospects in South Africa. Tru truncated for brevity. Conclusions. A. The South African Federation faces a similar issue to our own civil rights, despite never having implemented the so-called apartheid system proposed by the National Party. The continuing legal, social, and economic inequality between black and white South Africans are prime breeding grounds for social unrest, something the already weakened government cannot afford. Boer agitation in the northwest of South Africa has grown stronger in the past two years, especially as the government moves to pass legislation addressing racial inequality. The Boers live relatively isolated from the wider South African society and hold proud traditions of political independence and armed defense, and an organized uprising is likely to occur in the near future. A direct invasion by South Africa's northern neighbors, the African Reichskommissariats, or Reichskommissariats, will be very unlikely in the current situation, as they almost entirely rely on the motherland, or the mother nation, to provide material and political support to prop up the governments. All the military forces are tied up in internal peacekeeping operations, however. This should, should the support ever be withdrawn, their actions may turn erratic to the point of losing any sense of predictability. The wider American public would not be vehemently opposed to a direct intervention in South Africa, should the situation change to require it. Secret. Understood. For STEM, today, less than two weeks after the initial passing of the National Security Act by the Guyanese President or Parliament, the act has been suddenly repealed under the order of a surprise vote, left with no choice. Guyanese President Forbes Burnham gave the go-ahead for the repealing of the act. The President is now claiming that the, that the act was a temporary measure and it only needed to be in place for a short while. This comes as a shocking turn of events to most of the free world, with many experts expecting the strong wind Burnham to continue his opposition eliminating measures. The President refused for the comment, which has left many wondering, has Burnham had a change of heart? He'll be a lot less friendly now. Oh. Okay, cool. Para Maribo. Cool. We don't need American soldiers down there. No, 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 no. They're totally fine without us. Uh, you know what? Oh, you know what? Hmm, here's what I know what. Yeah. I want to improve my... Ooh, anti-sub helicopters. Improve attack helicopters. That's kind of cool. Ooh, we might want to improve some of this. Because I want to try out... Ooh, ground attack. Overwhelming support. I'm going to go ahead and grab this. I want to try out those spe these special divisions down here. I've never used them before. Airborne divisions. They're 12 combat width, which is eh. But they seem very, very interesting to use. They're sp oh, shnikes. 40, oh, 40 kilometers per hour. That is nice. Anyways, let's see. Let's get some uh, support weapons forward. That'd be very good. And let's also grab some more industry. 1962. Might as well go with Horizontal Industrial Organization DOS. Opposition's campaign. Oh, can we, can we can continue campaigning. Oh, yeah, that's right. I don't care. Uh, Money-wise, I'm much more concerned about this. 
Uh, you guys, well, how about you all? Brazil wins the World Cup final? Well, uh, good luck. Good job, guys. Good job, I guess. I don't really care. Uh, aggressive assaulter, yes, please. As offensive assaulter, yes, please. That just, there's no negotiating with that stuff. And the People's Revolutionary Council have defeated Minjing. Mongolian Civil War is probably over. Cool. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, we can have Jewish paramilitaries. Or paramilitaries. Paramilitaries. That sounds so cool. Crack down on the movement. Nixon's plot. The civil rights issue seems to have no end in sight. Families, friends, and even Congress divided on the best solution. Our great President Nixon, however, has come up with a plan to put down the dissidents or dissent once and for all. Those goddamn libs will learn to fall in line. And they will after Nixon crushes whatever crazy un American legislation they've come up with by his own hand. Estimates show that by turning his silence into lukewarm verbal only support, there will be just enough support to clear a supportive bill in the Senate. And Vice President Kennedy has just the bill. They're walking right into it. The suckers. Cool. Veto. <laughs> right, too many civil rights. Yeah. Uh, the progressives in the party will not be happy. A bit of the a bill will attempt to go through the Senate. You can find this bill in your decision stamps. Unfortunately, fortunately, he's going to veto it. Allowing the Civil Rights Act to go to the Senate will be the perfect move to stop it once and for all. Defeating the law will humiliate Kennedy, the Democrats, and the progressives, and a strong veto will show the nation our stance on the issue. If the people want change, maybe they should be less god dang militant. Well, let's see what happens. I don't know. I, I don't know what the effects are. Uh, after. I kind of know what the effects are after this, but we'll see what happens. I'm actually going to slash construction. Eh, actually, if we slash civilian, that'd be better. But we don't want to lower our stability, I mean, political power anymore. We need as much of that as possible. That Truman has collapsed. I might just go ahead and spend more, but I do want to cut down the debt more, so. Even though this is... Ooh. Don't mind if we do. Uh, this is okay. I, mean, I, I prefer cutting civilian spending, increasing construction, just because you get more of a deficit, but... Or a negative deficit. We already have four and then some, so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, let's see. Do we Are we missing anything? Tanks? APCs? Hey, yeah, they run a good campaign. Good for them. Tanks and APCs. Ooh, we have... Uh, there's anti-tank. Let's see. APCs need some more love, as well as tankies. Mm, improved transport. Oh, we definitely want to do that. Blackmail in the White House. Oh, boy. We'll do that too. Let's take some more. So, oh, the Hueys. Ah, Bell Hueys. The rigid manila envelope on the White House staffer's desk had nothing that struck him as unusual, save the absence of a return address. He tore the end open and peeked inside, finding nothing more than a small bundle of papers and photographs, but when he saw that they were, his blood ran cold. Internal memos from the 1960 Progressive National Convention, transcripts, transcripts of private conversations between NPP senators, schematics on wiretaps, a photo taken inside NPP campaign headquarters, and most chillingly, a letter from the Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman authorizing the espionage. At the bottom of the envelope was a note card with a message typed on it. Unless you want this on the front page, the post next week. Contact me and we'll talk. With the address for a PO box printed on the other side. The staff had enough wits about him to immediately reseal the envelope, call the FBI, and pass it on to them. In under an hour, it was on J. Edgar Hoover's desk. A brief call to Nixon informed him that the staffer agreed to stay quiet. The bureau's top men were already on setting, set on tracking the blackmailer down, and it'll all be over in a matter of days. Time to call some plumbers. Polls are updated. Oh, cool. I don't really care. Uh, plumbers. Da -da 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 -da. As I'm going to try my best. To keep party unity high between Republicans and Democrats. Let's see what happens. That's a strong lead for MPP for Alabama, huh? It looks like we are definitely going to be losing the Deep South. We probably are. Yeah. Yeah, we're probably going to lose the Deep South. Oh, well. Ooh, volunteer. Oh, we actually lose Army XP every day. Well, that kind of sucks. 0.67. Uh, it's still going up, so that's not too bad. Civil Rights. Oh, Civil Rights Act. The Turkey declared war. Cool. Uh, they proposed new civil rights bill to desegregate the South and provide more opportunities for African Americans. Not very popular with many Democrats, but it passed will mark the big first step toward full equality for all Americans. All 45 Republican senators support the bill. Six out of 40 Democrats support our bill. No room for further compromise. All five of the NPP's Social Democrat senators support, and none of the eight NPP's far right senators support it. Talk with the Republicans. <laughs> no one is willing to negotiate. Ah, I love it. Ah. Negotiations? We don't need that. So what are we spending here? It's a percentage, 8% percentage, eight of the GDP. And veto the civil rights. Cool! A new era for the RD Dons. Shock, horror, delight, and a myriad of other feelings bubbled in the Senate today as the news of the surprise veto of Kennedy's Civil Rights Act trickled in. With Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson garnering enough support to push the bill through the floor, not to Nixon's desk. Most assumed that its passing was a foregone conclusion. But that was not to be. 
with a big red veto stamped across a copy submitted to the President Nixon. While conservatives and the Dixiecrats celebrated defense of American ideals, many progressives, both Democrat and Republican, see this betrayal as the final straw in a long, long line of inaction and pig-headed appeasement. Senator murmur whispers of defection and revolt in the back rooms while the party celebrates its unity. The back of the Republican Democrats is broken, and wolves among the MPP circles ever closer. A new era for the RD's dawn. And so the defections begin, the MPP shifts to the left, we get northern riots. Oh, that's not good. A crack in the facade. The National Security Council has been gathered by or, gathered by order of the President and by recommendation of the Treasury Secretary McNamara. Now, Bob, you've told me this just ain't about the Madagascar blockade. It better not be. You told me there'd be no hang-ups on that issue. Not at all, Mr. President. McNamara shifted slightly in his seat. The Director of Central Intelligence actually asked me to have you convene the Council. He glanced at the Director, who held a pipe to his lips, his mouth curled in a glib smile. Get on with it then, the President urged. We put with a puff of smoke, he leaned in and began. Mr. President, we have contacts high up... Uh, we have contacts high up within the German colonial administration in Madagascar. We have total reason to believe that they have some misgivings about their loyalties to Berlin. With the weakening of the German Empire and with Hitler becoming increasingly ill, it's becoming apparent that a conflict may break out on the island sooner rather than later. We have word that rebels are planning to make their move soon, and the local government is divided. Nixon shrugged. Who are these contacts? Can we be sure of their sincerity? McNamara pushed his glasses further up on his nose. For dramatic effect, the director puffed again from his pipe. Mr. President, our contact is Reichskommissar Emil Maurice. Emil Maurice sounds very familiar. Nixon seemed stunned for a moment, but collected himself quickly. My goodness, that's great. And he has a direct line to Hitler? The director nodded. Maurice is one of Hitler's oldest confidants. Their relationship has been strained as of late, which is partly why he wants out, and his word, we think, is good. Nixon nodded in silence for several moments before continuing. Well, gosh dang it, keep me updated on this. If you find any way to breach the bastion, you let me know immediately. Let's see if we can make a dent in the unity pact. Well, we're denting our own pact here. <sighs> Tricky Dick is up at it again. Now, you can protect our interests. And I kind of I kind of want to. Yeah, should we need to? Our first material commitment in South Africa will make it easier. South Africa secured. Um, let's go to uh, uh, India. The Forgotten Allies. The Old Entente assumed the German people had learned love of peace in the Great War. They also assumed the German government had held true to its promises thereafter. Moreover, they assumed the German army had no business prevailing against the combined forces of two world empires, and that they will fold in a second world war, or second war as they had in the first. Well, this, is, this isn't the India one, but I want to do this one anyways. Germany proved them wrong in all three counts by raising the swastika over Paris and London. On that end, ignoble climax that America has since been forced to leave its allies' governments to Hitler's mercy. Operative word, says the CIA. Governments. With an appropriately sized black budget, the allies' rest of peoples will be forgotten no longer. And we get a whole 1% more stability and 2% more war support. Cool. How's this? How's the economy looking? Looking not bad. Slowly, slowly, slowly cutting down that debt. GDP, we could invest in that, but nah. Oh, the world is falling apart. A little bit of lag, and the triumvirate bird is gone. What are they fighting down here? They really kind of are. Kind of nice. So, I have two army XP. Uh, the Marines. Um, we're probably enough. And certificate champion, Henry Jackson, known affectionately to his contemporaries as Scoop, sat at his desk, looking expectantly at the two figures sitting opposite. Maureen Newberger, Scoop's deputy and fellow senator in the MPP's center wing, quietly thumbed through her notes as she waited for him to speak. Next to her sat the nominal head of the center's more radical wing, Michael Harrington, who waited with the same expectant look as Scoop himself. The two could not be more different, but as center's leader, Scoop knew he needed both if the party was going to get anywhere. As you know, our election prospects are still looking dire, began Scoop. The right still holds plenty of influence over the party, and no progressive voter is going to vote for the party whose last candidate was strong god dang Thurman. Worst of all, we still don't even have a candidate. Well, it would help if anyone had bothered to put their name forward, joked Harrington, with a bare hint of contempt. Perhaps if we were to do more than to support our core working class voters in the Midwest and elsewhere, rather than kowtowing to segregationists and filling our ranks with West Coast elitist types. Newberger herself of proud Oregon Sox sat up with an offended look. Everyone here is fighting for the same thing. I've done just plenty to speak up for the underprivileged. At least I don't sit around writing essays about it. Scoop sat still for a moment, smiling bemusingly or bemusedly as his colleagues continued to bicker and snipe at one another. In a way, they were a perfect reflection of the sinner as a whole, determined to enact change but endlessly at their at its own throat about what change should be. Finally he coughed and the other two immediately ceased their childish exchange and looked to him once more. You are both very different, which is exactly why we need someone who can speak everyone's language. If we're going to have any hope in this election, we need to move forward with one voice. Harrington and Newberger looked at each other unsure. unsure. Unsure of what to say. Scoop glanced out of the window with an uncertain look. I don't know who the man to lead us is, but he better show up soon or we are screwed. Who will speak for the center? Who knows? Not me. I don't know. I'm just here trying to fix my economy. I just want to get more liquid reserves, please. I could get construction actually more, but 
I don't know. I like four. Four and some. I think that's a good amount. Four and some is a good amount. And gotta save that PP. Point four a day. God dang, the FBI pounces. The task of apprehending the unknown White House blackmailer was hardly difficult. The P.O. box had been registered under a false name and paid for in cash, so the FBI pay, decided to play along and write a letter agreeing to the blackmailer's demands uh, and asked to meet in person. Surprisingly, the blackmailer showed up suspecting nothing and was immediately nabbed by federal agents. My apologies about that. The blackmailer turned out to be 24-year-old NPP activist, one Charles B. Uno, or Juno, uh, but they had little success getting more than that out of him. He had refused to say anything besides requests for a lawyer, but the fingerprint evidence left no doubt to him being the one who sent the envelope. The Bureau's best guess is that he's a misguided progressive who wanted to force through the change with some underhanded methods, but that's all it got to go on with. Charges of espionage and mail fraud are already working their way through the pipeline, and hopefully he'll go to trial by November. With any luck and a bit of nudging from the White House, it could get moved up to October or late September, meaning that he'll safely be, be behind bars when the midterm elections roll around. Three cheers to Hoover and his boys. Good job, Hoover. And they run a good campaign. Good for them. Good for them. Forgotten allies. Northern rights. When is, well, maybe they'll never. Maybe they'll stay there for a while. Because that really sucks. That hurts our stability, too. Mm, looking pretty. a little better on this, maybe. Are we training them? No, we're not training them. Huh. Tanks not looking good. Maybe I should stop making or doing this training for tanks. Hmm. It's alright, though. They need it. We'll make enough tanks eventually. Yet another leak. Tricky Dick stands in the Oval Office, thoughtfully looking out of a window. Dawn broke far on the horizon, a blazing orange-red sun rising in the distance, casting a warming light across the White House lawn. He sighs it was going to be another long, dull day. Meetings and bills and foreign policy. A sharp rap on the door jolts him slightly. Someone wanted a word at a quarter past six in the morning. Nixon pauses for a second, and the nods come in. Haldeman stepped through the doorway. A newspaper rolled up in his fist. What is, what is it? Nixon asked. Bad news, Dick. We're not done with Berman yet. Without another word, Haldeman flings the paper down on the president's desk, turning it around such that Nixon could read the headline. Nixon supporting Gianni's segregation. Whistleblower, Nixon mutters to himself. He reads the article. Somehow the news found out. Somehow they knew the government got Forbes Berman elected. Somehow they knew that Nixon administration still supported him and his racial segregation policies. Nixon rubs his nose, taking a deep breath. Haldeman, he says, get Kennedy and Laird. Call a meeting. I need a phone line to the CIA director. Oh boy, this is heating up. I just need a little, I just want just a little bit more army XP, please. Just just a little bit more. I want to get to five so I can stop training these things. Polls are updated. Cool. Mm, it says a toss up. Oh, the West Coast is a toss up now. Oh boy. Uh, the Rockies are gray. The Great Plains are gray. Uh, the Great Lakes are starting to shift around, actually, especially in Ohio. Uh, it might Wisconsin might go crazy. Indiana is going going nuts as well. Oh boy. Yesterday we were doing really well, but now it's going to go, woo! Forgotten allies, cool. Artillery barrage, great. The first fallen domino. Influence of Norwegian resistance, helping out a friend. So let's do the smashing the crest wave next. When he rushed the giant's prized cattle for his tenth labor, Hercules journeyed farther uh, westwards than the borders his maps detail. Before returning to Mycenae, my Sene, he erected two mountain sized pillars where the narrowing coast met Poseidon's boundless blue dominion. Inscribed upon these pillars, demarking, uh, demarcating the world's seemingly, seeming's edge were the words Ne plus ultra, no further beyond. The erudite can draw parallels between Japanese Empire's conquest and the Greek hero's tenth labor. Like Hercules, its armies and fleets ventured towards the continent's westernmost edge to wrest wealth and glory from the Europe's giants. Like Hercules, they halted at a body of water, in this case the river Ganges, and ventured no further. But unlike Hercules, they feasted merrily on their spoils for years hence. Now their grasping at its empire's edges have become a Herculean labor for Tokyo's corpulent digits. In effect, India and Southeast Asia have turned into cracks, running alongside an otherwise perfect sphere's surface. And with a little help from Washington, these cracks can widen into gorgeous tearing Japan's pet project apart. Ooh, Asian opportunities will appear. Very cool. Uh, let's keep doing this ground support. I'm going to go with support companies next. That sounds like great fun. I love support companies. Military austerity? I don't think so. Ah, we're doing better here. An internal investigation, despite the jubilation about catching the blackmailer, the mood in the White House and the Department of Justice building quickly turned sour when an unpleasant piece of information came forward. Charles Juno wasn't acting alone. Oh no. There was no way that the envelope could have been screened and intercepted with the other incoming mail unless a co-conspirator on the inside had helped to get it through. The Secret Service immediately began investigating potential leads in the mail room, but to little success so far. The White House staff are all whispering about something that's going on, and most of them suspect that it's an information breach that involves the NPP in some way. Even worse are the rumors going about that another gray scares on the horizon. 
person, but directed at any and all NPP members. Although this is currently limited to the White House, and there are certainly very few professed NPP members in the Nixon administration, it would lead to widespread panic if the news leaked to the rest of the executive branch's bureaucracy, let alone the press. This is getting complicated, but how democracy dies? Berman was no idiot. He clearly knew the key to executing any coup was to limit communication during and only letting people find out about the coup once it was a fait accompli, which is why he made sure to invite the American and Canadian ambassadors to a formal dinner. While they ate filet and sipped champagne, the soldiers of the Guyanese Defense Force occupied the Parliament building, shutting down the switchboards and broadcasting stations, dragged MPs out of their homes and into the police vans, and carried out summary court marshals and sentencing for particularly egregious traitors to the Republic. It was not until Ambassador Spencer King returned to the American Embassy that he learned about what had transpired, and jury-rigged chain of communication and managed to put him back in touch with Washington. Nixon called an emergency meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and one conclusion was reached, this shall not stand, not on our watch. Cool. Oh, we get some planes. We go to war with them, but what happens if we don't do anything? Hmm, and look at all these ships. Oh boy. Basic cruiser hulls. Uh, were we making? This is my light cruiser, I believe. Oh, these are not great ships. Uh, I'm just gonna throw you all right there. Uh, where are you guys? You guys are over here. That's fine. If that's the case. We'll raid if they, if we can. But other than that, what happens if we lose? That doesn't seem like it'll be very good for us. Oh man, look, the world's turning purple. Oh boy. R&D support is very low. Yeah, okay, maybe we can do it once. Just for funsies. Let's do it in... We did the West Coast before. Uh, uh, West Coast. Uh, meh. The Great Lakes. Toss up there. Toss up. MPP. Let's do it with the Great Lakes. Just for funsies. Alright. Oh, three more. Three more. Oh, wow. Three more tank divisions. Cool. Come on, come on, come on. Airborne divisions, I want to make you a little thicker. Air assault. That's that's pretty cool, honestly. Cool. Is there a 14 combo with? Oh, it puts us over to our right. god dang it, we can't even use that. God dang it. Um Well, so be it. 16, 12, 12. Uh well then we'll increase this then. Uh who do we have more of? Tanks or APs? Never mind. All right, well, we'll just use more main battle tanks then. Stop, stop. Cool. So now we're gonna make a positive amount because we're out of tanks and APCs. This is not good. Woo! Go and do two there, and then we're really gonna improve this. Get up to there. Get up to there first too. Cool. Point three six. Still got northern rides. So be it. Whatever. Not really interested. The American Malays. So be it. So what happens? If, I really, I, I'm not really sure what happens if we do lose here. That's why I pulled my soldiers up, just to see what happens. How's the GDP looking? 0.5. They run an incredible campaign. We need to step up our game. A Silent Spring. Man is a part of nature, and his war against nature is a war against himself. These were a few of the ch chilling words marine biologist Rachel Carson used to decry America's ignorant addiction to pesticides in her newly released book, Silent Spring. A product of nearly four years of original research into government-funded eradication campaigns, the 400-page publication asserts that the chemicals used for pest removal, DDT, aminotriazole, 2,4-D harm more, far more than the vermin they were made to exterminate. They instead seep into the soil and render it impotent, she claims, and linger in the fruits and crops Americans eat. In response to the accusations, DuPont and Velsicol Chemical have filed libel suits against a re researcher. The efforts to preserve their standings have thus far, however, been stymied by both the Court of Law and the Court of Public Opinion. The book itself has shot up to first place in the New York Times bestsellers for nonfiction, a sign of the American people's approval of a whistleblower increasingly compared to Upton Sinclair. Uh, leading scientists now remark that a nationwide ban of synthetic poisons, uh, America's laboratories peddle is now only a matter of when. For the future. Cool. Cool. Now we have one, two, three, four, and we're still improving here. Nice. Oh, did we get more GDP? Good. Come on, I just want to get down to 128 some billion. We're so close. We're so close. It's only October 2nd. We gotta keep going. Dominican Republic, Haiti, huh? How's this looking now? How purple is it? Eh, it's not bad. So, they've gone with center. And these guys are center. Uh, Turkey wins. Oh, Turkey wins. Peace in the Middle East, huh? And so the purple is center? Hmm. Interesting. Cool. So, Panda now goes to Washington. 
President Richard Nixon met with Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru in the White House today. The meeting of the first between Nixon and Nehru was the first stop on the Prime Minister's visit to the U.S., soon to be followed by multiple stops in Washington, Virginia, and New York. At the Oval Office, President Nixon reaffirmed America's commitment to deepening America's political and economic ties to India. India is a vast nation blessed with a multitude of resources and a rising population. It is the belief of the administration that the United States of America would be foolish if we didn't embrace the republic and all the opportunities that it offers the world. Following the President's remarks, Prime Minister Nehru returned with cordiality of his own. The people of India are on the verge of great success in the fields of economics, societal progress, and national development. We wish to use this success to join hands with the free world, and I would like to thank the President for his efforts to bring our nation closer together. What's next? Hamburgers in Bombay? Hmm. Bring out the tinderbox. Well, where are options? The Indian subcontinent. Yes. From the one Raja's corpse sprung two governments, following the British withdrawal, the Republic of India, and the Azad Hind movement coalesced in Bengal. War weariness, war weariness had deprived Japan of its momentum by the time they set their sight to the British Empire's crown jewel, impelling them to free most of India as a neutral power. Instead, now Tokyo has since seemed content with letting their cat paws in Calcutta, bet against their adversaries in New Delhi for the subcontinent's destiny. <clears throat> the U.S. can and will do its part in tilting the odds towards a fellow democracy's favor. Already a slew of American companies have begun moving part of their assets into its growing cities in anticipation of a growing relationship between Nixon's inevitable entourages, which will they which they will catalyze. Cool, my apologies. Sometimes my words get mixed up and my eyes are like, ooh, you can't read right. A good R&D campaign, cool. That's gonna do nothing for us though, probably, in the end. Very nice, 54 political power, 0.36. War support's pretty low. We got some more support weapons, which is great, great, great. And let's get even some more. Improvement six, awesome. I'm really, I'm a little, uh, I wouldn't say frustrated, I'm a little disappointed that we don't have actually art uh, infantry, normal infantry battalions. Pulse updated. Cool. When does this end? It's October 19th. Uh, oh. Looking more and more purple every day. Center MPPs, 15. Far right MPPs are 8. Okay. Far right. Center. Uh, the Great Lakes have definitely defected. Um, the West Coast is kind of defected. Yeah, the center of America is looking pretty R&D. With uh, Tennessee and North Carolina and Kentucky and Florida, too, looking kind of okay. But we'll see. I really want more wealth, so. Increased party unity, that'd be good. Uh, 38 de Republicans, 37 Democrats, 15 are center MVP. Cool. And honestly, if I make a mistake, I'll probably try to... With the path I want to go, if I make a mistake, then I will probably do stuff off-screen just to make sure that we can do okay. Hey, there we go. It's almost $129 billion, but that looks... A little bit better in my mind. Just a little bit better. Not that much better, but a little bit better. Hoover's offer. Good afternoon, Dick. J. Edgar Hoover said as he stepped into the Oval Office, quietly shutting the door behind him. Nixon furrowed his brow and replied, I did not call... I told you not to call me that. You tell me a lot of things, Mr. President. Well, I've had to postpone the one press conference where the media wasn't going to be after my head, so this had better be good. What Hoover had to say wasn't, but it certainly was important. The FBI's investigation into the origins of the blackmailers had seen little success, but there still remained the question of what to do with the blackmail itself. However, Hoover, ever cautious and considerate, asked the president whether it would be the best to seal it away in some classified vault or destroy it as much as possible. Either way, it would hopefully stay buried forever, although it could see some value in the future. Uh, the existence of the blackmail could, after all, provide a rather large boon to the president in the upcoming midterm elections. Burn it all. Keep it a secret. Burn it all. Mm, I'm not really sure what to do with this one. Let's see. Burn it all. You know what? Keep them safe. Let's see what happens if we can keep them safe. That might be good for us later on. Oh, a little bit of lag. And they run a good campaign. Cool. And I will be right back. All right. My apologies about that, but I had to go use the restroom real quick like. But anyways, we are back, and we have Class 3 Senate elections. After months of politicking, spending debates, stump speeches, and campaigns rising and falling, the big night is here. Americans from every walk of life are gathering around radios, television sets, or on street corners to hear the news. Will their candidate win? Will their opponent go down in defeat? What will be the big news story tomorrow? What newcomer will upset the incumbent? Or what damaged office holder will defy the odds and get another term? What or that and more will be announced tonight. Of course, while the hundreds of races for mayors, governors, and representatives are important races in their own right, it's the Senate elections that most people are focused on. With the political people from the Senate, from the Republican, Democrat, and National Progressive Party coalitions, the upper house of Congress has become the battleground for America's heart and ideals. The makeup of the Senate will soon be revealed to the waiting public. Shh, everyone be quiet. I can't hear the TV. Cool. Wow, California's... Ooh, not purple. R&D support is middling, and MPPP support is middling as well. 
Oh, very low RD support in West Virginia. Ohio's low, very high. The Indian subcontinent. Very good. Very, very good. Anything else we can do on the left side here? Not really. Keep it clean. <laughs> Reestablish the party. Investigate corruption. Oh, has Burgundy finally done it? Maybe, maybe not. Alright. <laughs> Reinforce the elephant. It's splendid isolation. Has opted with the withdrawal from the global stage. Oh. America for America. Reinforce the OFN. The Australian plan. Oh, this looks like kind of fun. Get them on board. Naval fortresses. Withdraw. Withdraw from the OFN. Wow. Cool. Recognize it in Republic of India. Whether out of fear for renewing tensions with Japan or simple indifference, the U.S. government has, had neither received nor accorded either of India's governments since 46. In hindsight, America acquiesced perhaps too readily in the spheres of vaporous threats when it could have earlier laid the groundwork for countering its ambitions in the Asia Pacific. The Nixon administration re reversed this trend by acknowledging opportunity out of a geopolitical hotspot. In the following weeks, the president himself shall visit New Delhi to formally recognize Mr. Nehru as president of the subcontinent's rightful government. We get political power, great! And other people won't like us, but I don't really care. I really don't care. Tricky Dick is up at it. Ooh, invest in startup companies. Ooh. Our reserves will lose some money, but our growth will increase. Influx of cash. Expenses will rise. National debt will increase, but our growth will increase. Uh, oh, oh, I don't want to... Mm, I want to do this, but I know I need to save political power up for later. Ooh, maybe just do one. Maybe we'll just do one. We can lose a little bit of money for, from our reserves, right? That's okay, right? Hand out loans. You know what? We'll do this one instead. Hand out loans. Just, 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 just one. Just, just a little more growth. 3.5%, right? Can we get to like four? That'd be great. I would love 4%. 4% sounds great. 4% inflation? Too much for me. But 4% for more GDP growth is not enough. But I'll take it. I'll take it. 62 still. We're pretty much done here. We could do this, but we're America for now. Uh, let's see. Engineering wise, we're pretty good. Your accidents chance. Uh, why not? Okay. Why not? Why not? And land auction. Let's go and do this one too. Preemptive strike. That'd be pretty good to do that as well. Come on, just a little bit more. I don't want to spend too much political power, but it, it's a necessary evil. Oh, a little bit of lag there. Oh. Minus. Yeah, we're working on this. The Urgun takes over in the Levant. The Jews have found their Zion, but at what cost? Oh. The city of Israel. Very cool. Very nice. El Arich. Hello, Menachem Begin. Cox severely injured in the Kiev bombing. Note from Russia. President briefing on the free city of Magadan. Contents. <clears throat> the nation of Russia has been a great unknown since the end of the Second World War. Following Barbarossa and the Soviet Union's collapse, the CIA could g scarcely glean any info from the vast country. Except for the West Russian War of the 50s, the Russia of our imagination has become accessible of violence and fighting, and with the German bombings preventing any attempts of regional warlords to consolidate power. At least this seems to be the case in West Russia and Siberia, with a land stretch that's or land area that stretched from the Baltic to the Pacific. There's some stretches of territory untouched by the banditry and chaos that plagues the areas adjacent to the German Reich. <clears throat> From Central Siberia, the primary recipient of the Bukharan era Siberian plan, we have heard that the Republic has risen and collapsed there between the Second World War and the West Russian War. <clears throat> then there is the Russian Far East, a region that the CIA has been observing for quite some time. In brief, the legitimate government of the Soviet Union, under the provisional government or leadership of Genrik Yagoda, retreated there after their defeat. Subsequently, the anti-Bolshevik front sprang out from Manchuria and Harbin, making significant gains before shattering into three parts based on Chita, Magadan, and Amur. In particular, interest of this briefing is the Free State of Magadan, led by Mikhail Matovsky, a local fascist of some repute. He and his former and his foreign minister, Nikolai Petnim, has promised reforms and democracy should the U.S. support their bid for the Azi Matkovsky insisted. Great crusade for Russia as well as intelligence and information. The agency notes that the decision is the president's alone to make. However, it cautions the president in supporting any fascist bid for Russia. Moreover, the aforementioned minister, Petlin, seems to be a more malleable candidate for leadership. Whatever the president decides, the agency shall carry it out. Lend him our tentative support in exchange for reforms. We could use the intel. Just, just a little bit of growth. Just, just, you know what? Just a small bit. I don't want to lose any reserves, so... Oh, it went back up higher. No! No, we were working on that so nicely. No. No more debt. Close updated since elections. Results are in. That was a long day. 
With the heady days of campaigns behind, the dust begins to settle across the U.S. The votes have been tallied, races, close races called, victory and concession speeches given. Posters are taken down, buttons slashed or stashed in drawers, and the population begins to return to a sense of normalcy. The incumbents who won the races return to their offices to get back to work, while those politicians that lost races or declined to run last time are making their plans to back up their papers and staff to return back to their homes and civilian lives. Idealistic newcomers of every ideological stripe are still riding high in victory as they sort their fears to make the move to their state, capital, or Washington. Those that lost return back to their old jobs and old lives, saddened and disappointed that they will not serve, but nevertheless proud of what they had accomplished. But while the political machines of the RDs and the NPP are shut down to go into hibernation, as the process of governing country resumes, soon enough they will be turned on again, and the long, exhausting, exhilarating, and exuberant election cycle will begin again. Candidates and voters, you've done America proud. Cool. Now we can't even see that, and we can do more important things. Wow, we really lost a lot of Republican support. There's a lot more center NPPs and a few more far right NPPs. Woo! You two almost shot down over England. Yesterday, German fighters based out of Northern England nearly shot down a CIA UTC piloted by Lieutenant Francis Gary Powers. Powers had just entered English airspace when four Horn Ho 229 flying wings were detected on radar. However, three were forced to return back due to fuel range, one which crashed in the North Sea when it got overzealous and ran out of fuel for the return trip. The final aircraft managed to get within missile range and fired the powers with what appears to be an experimental missile designed specifically to shoot down the U-2 before peeling off to return to base. Powers evaded the missile and then proceeded on course, uh, completing his mission and returning to Eisenhower's AFB in Iceland. Due to the classified nature of the mission, we cannot let it be known publicly that our aircraft was engaged by the German fighters. No diplomatic protest will be issued, and no German scare will take the front page of the morning's newspaper, not this time. Good job, Gary. Gary. Wow, this part of the country is very... not this color. <laughs> That's what I can say about it. Actually, let me see this. Uh, societal trends. We're slowly improving academic base. Nothing for research facilities. Nothing for agriculture. Nothing for poverty. Nothing down there. But we're doing better with industrial expertise, which is nice. As well as army professionals. Recognize the Republic of India. Flash. As President of the United States, it is my honor to recognize Her Excellency Vijaya Lakashimi Pandit. Flash. As Ambassador Extraordinary in the... Plenipotentiary from the Republic of India to the United States of America. Flash. Naru's sister, Marty Lederhander, thought. Hell of a pick. Marty had only gotten the call an hour ago. The White House had wanted a photographer on hand for this historic moment, and they figured out that he was unlikely to leak anything until after the credentialing ceremony. President Nixon and Ambassador Pennett picked up the binder of credentials and held it between them, smiling gamely in that classic diplomatic style. Flash. Marty can now only picture what it was like in the Tokyo Foreign Office and right now. The formal recognition of the Republic over the Japanese puppets in Azad Hind would surely draw plenty of ire. Then again, he thought, it's not like the tensions were high, weren't high already. How bad could this be? Sir, uh, the Calcutta representative is on the line. He sounds mad. Whatever. Our, and our money. Invest in India. Ooh. Give them our arms. Uh, I invest our money. And our money. And of the constraint the Republic of India faces is a dearth of both capital and the means to generate such rampant tax evasion, nurtured by an antiquated Byzantine Codex of Regulations, hampers New Delhi's industrialization programs with an ever-present shortfall of money. These factors lock their economy under a perpetual stagnating cycle between a lack of cash for building factories and a lack of factories for making cash. Fortunately, both American investments and American factories are willing to cross the two oceans for India's relief. All they need is President Nixon's fountain pen and, of course, some incentives from the country's ample reserves. Yeah, 70 political power, not bad. 0.36 a day, which is not good. We could do that. And hopefully... Come on, more than 3.5%. Ah, it's only 3.8. And you know I'll take it. I'll take 0.3% increase in GDP. That's okay. If that's going to be the case, then I'm not going to do invest in startup companies because I don't want to spend the political power because we need to keep our PP. As Roman Eagle losing her feathers. Ooh. Subsidized businesses? Meh, that's not really worth it, I think. This might affect our relations with the Indian nation. Or the Republic of India, I should really say. Wow, that's a thick Afghanistan. Look how big that is. Wow. That's a big Afghanistan. Uh, the 1962 NFL Championship game. Yankee Stadium. The stadium most known for hosting the legendary New York Yankees baseball club became the site of the ultimate football conclusion. The NFL Championship game, in its 30th edition, pitted the Green Bay Packers against the New York Giants in a brutal 60-minute slugfest. The weather in the field registered at 17 degrees Fahrenheit with 35 to 40 mile per hour winds. Wow. One of the coldest sports events ever played. The Green Bay Packers, led by legendary Hall of Fame coach Vince Lombardi and wow, and University of Alabama quarterback Bar Bart Starr, faced a stalwart New York defense led by middle linebacker Sam Huff and defensive end Andy Rust Robustelli. 
NBC broadcasts a widely anticipated game across the U.S. The Packers started out strong, scoring the first 10 points unopposed in the first half of the game. The Giants came back with a touchdown, but the team would never match its opponent's point total. The Packers would win the championship by a total of 16 to 7 after kicking two more field goals. The most valuable player on the team on the game was Ray Nitsch. Packers middle linebacker who recorded two fumbles and a pass deflection for the Green Bay defense. Another proud achievement for the state of Wisconsin. Oh, the cheeseheads. That's definitely not Ohio. Let's go and do this. And are we back down? Please, and we're back down. Omar Ali Saifuddin the third becomes Sultan of Sinojoinen. Bulgaria goes in isolation. Okay, a free Bulgaria? Who saw that coming? Usually they don't go free Bulgaria. Usually they align with Germany or Italy. Wow. Really? Really? In my last game I played in TNO... They stayed with Germany, but okay. Okay, Bulgaria, are you feeling okay? Simeon the second? Oh, you got, you got that neck beard going on, don't you? Oh, boy. Despotism. Uh, looks like you don't have a really good focus tree here, just saying, but that's just me. Let's go ahead and do some tactical support. We want to get through our land auction quickly. I want to get through as fast as possible. Uh, better artillery, we might as well do that. Because the next one is at 1970, so. Because I really want to use these guys, and they have artillery, and I want to make sure that their artillery is god tier. Or as much as god tier as possible. A little bit of lag, what's going on? Oh, it's 1963. Happy 1963, my friends. We finally got there. Welsh Unionists win the election. Set, go. Hi. Meet the new boss again. Red, white, and blue balloons stream into the air as a muggy afternoon and wind rustles the bunting down, uh, bunting strewn liberally all over the streets of Montgomery. George Wallace steps down from the podium to thunderous applause. The crowd hooting and hollering flush from his triumphal victory speech. Wallace walks from the podium into the state capitol, smiling and waving to the crowd, ready to be sworn in for the second time as the governor of Alabama. Though it's unsurprisingly not uncommon for the winners of a goober national election to celebrate the fact, this is a more momentous occasion than it appears on the surface. For the first time, a politician of the NPP has been re-elected to any position, and the party members are celebrating all across the nation. Even those from the left-leaning center faction, opposed to the policy of Wallace's far-right faction, can be found celebrating the party's triumph. This undeniably cements the increasing importance of the NPP in American politics, as it rises in stature to be a viable second party able to challenge the dominance of the Republican Democrats. Whether this is just a one-off fluke or a portent of things to come, however, remains to be seen. There's a new sheriff in town. Oh, boy, oh, I can't wait to see what happens. Can't wait. Traveling Lady. How do you move from one of the most famous paintings in the world from its regular home across an ocean and on display without damaging it or risking the threat of robbery? Simple. Pack it in a specially designed bulletproof casing that are also protected from temperature, humidity, and UV rays. And make it waterproof and floatable just to be on the safe side. And then transport it under armed guard with motorcades, block traffic, and more to deliver it to the ship to take it to the trip across the Atlantic. Then when it does arrive in New York, load it into an armored van and take it to the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And when it's finally displayed, station two Marines, each with loaded rifles on either side to ensure no one gets near it. The more interesting question, however, is why would you send one of the most famous paintings in the world to the U.S.? When the French heard that the, the government was considering loaning the Mona Lisa to the U.S. for a couple months, there were riots and protests. The painting had been in the Louvre for so long, through war and catastrophe, an enduring symbol of French cultural history, even if it was taken from the Italians hundreds of years ago, don't question, and now is being given to the Americans? What a travesty this is. To hell with diplomacy. This is an outrage that can never be lived down. But for the half a million Americans, including the President, every member of the House of Representatives and Senate, the Justices of the Supreme Court, and many, many more average people, the image captured by Leonardo da Vinci, the Mona Lisa has captivated a nation and people that for so long was considered uncultured. Within weeks, museums and art galleries ar around the U.S. reported an uptick in visits to see what they had on display, even if nothing could match the gracefully, graceful lady that will soon return back home. I always thought it was a little bigger. I don't think I've... I've definitely never seen it in real life. But, you know, that's kind of interesting. Hmm. I'm thinking about the French state right now. Oh, I guess I know Focus Tree. Brittany. Hmm. Oh, they're fascists. The, uh, the moderate fascist wing. Okay. Because they have a unique Focus Tree, which looks very interesting. I don't know if they can really do stuff. I know they can go to war against the French state later on, but... We'll see what happens. We barely got into 63, and this video is almost 49 minutes long. John Glenn wins at Ohio Goober National Race at the end of a nail-biting election that literally came down fractions of a percent. Untested pol politician John Glenn had been elected governor of Ohio for the Republican wing of the RD Party. A popular figure among middle Americans and a household name from his auspicious career as America's most prominent astronaut, Glenn's victory has cemented the, the political ambitions that began when he, began when he gave a major speech criticizing Nixon's decision to defund NASA. For now, though, Glenn sits in the Ohio State House planning his next move, thinking in decades. With his popular support and now his political foothold's governor, there's practically no limit to how far his ambition could take him. Already he imagines himself in the White House and begins to set in motion his glacial plan to get there and change the fate of America forever, even if such a goal would yet to be is so far away. The phone rings, he picks it up knowing Nixon to be on the other side and accepts the president's gritted congratulations with magnanimity. Glenn knew that he could deal with Nixon and his ilk. 
Nobody could stand his way to the presidency. One giant leap. And presidential veto caught into question. Good afternoon, Mr. President. There's some good news and some bad news today. Your veto of the act uh, of the act the progressives try to push through seems to have taken the wind out of their sails, although analysts are projecting protests to continue into the near future. It looks like the worst is over. The Midwest and New England are naturally quite upset about how this has all turned out, but we can afford to lose some slack, or uh, well, for now at least so. And here's the bad news. Those slanderers in the press are honest again, calling your veto terms such as an overreach of power and a dirty trick. It's like they've never even heard of politics and reality, or reality. But there are a lot of people turning away from our party now, not in the least the senators who defected. I mean, there are even rumors about our very own Vice President Kennedy jumping ship to the NPP and running as their 64 candidate. Can you believe it? A goddamn Kennedy stabbing the nation in the back again! The nerve of some people! They'll shut up eventually. So, do we actually lower this? No, we don't. So, I had our money. Invest in India! New expansions to the duckyards at Candela, financed by Wells Fargo Bank and TIAA, which I... Okay then. Blast furnace courtesy of engineers from Bethlehem Steel to kickstart a new iron industry in Karnataka. Agreements from companies such as Fruit of the Loom, Woolrit, and Brooks Brothers. Ooh. To source more cotton from fields in Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh. All these developments and more are filling financial papers across the country. It seems that every American company with enough capital is putting money into Indian projects. The state of U.S. Indian relations is at an all time high, and as a result, Investors see incredible opportunities in the Republic. India will get new jobs and boosted incomes, while American companies will reap new profits and American consumers will be able to buy new cheap goods. It's a win-win! Tell me more about these mythical investments in India. Ooh. Tell me more, please. And our arms are start of something beautiful. Our GDP will increase. Yes. Give them our arms, then. As it stands, the Indian arms industry remains a white paper held by some nondescript official from the Republic's Ministry of Defense. In lieu of well-established arms companies operating under their jurisdiction, India has relied on imports from a coterie of foreign contractors to fulfill their armed forces' needs. Admittedly, such an arrangement suits a country facing neither insurgency nor invasion, a state of affairs which can reverse overnight at Calcutta's immediate behest. In contrast, American gunsmiths sell guns and ammunition by the millions even within its own market. These companies are, incidentally, all too happy to serve as another in a more formal basis. The White House is of course all too eager to oblige both parties need and i want to get through at least one more focus before we end this episode unless there's going to be some sort of tragedy that strikes hopefully a tragedy doesn't strike and i keep forgetting we're actually at war with guiana still when does that end do we call white peace eventually i think we should probably will liberty of the few well it definitely hurts the stability it's minus 45 percent i'd hate to be as how much political power he's not getting and he has no focus cool i'm just hanging out here Playing as Tricky Dick, giving or selling Indians some arms, increasing the GDP, and lowering our debt. What could be better? We, we might have vetoed some civil rights. Eh, whatever, you know, things happen. But, uh, India. Great. Oh, Guyana and the Goliath. Early this morning, the leaders of the two nations, Guyana and the U.S., met to discuss peace terms. I was just asking about this. Great. This news comes following a stunning series of setbacks, defeats, and stalemates for an unprepared American military during its invasion of the small Caribbean country. I didn't invade. What do you mean? President Forbes Burma of Guyana claimed that this was a truly amazing show of Guyana's fortitude and strength, a tale of how the small can defeat the mighty. Nixon is planning on flying back to the States once the peace talks are concluded. The Guyanan War, as it now is being called, lasted just over five months and became exceptionally unpopular once American forces stalled after initial success. I didn't even show up. Guyanese soldiers provided fierce resistance, and our nation now mourns the loss of so many men for so little. Many regard this war as just another example of, pri of not Prime Minister, but President Nixon's incapable administration. The President himself, however, had no comment and refused to give any public announcement regarding this humiliating defeat of American forces. Uh, William Rogers flicks off the television, sighing deeply. Burnham has actually done it. He defeated the giant Guyana and Goliath. Just another nail in the coffin for the Nixon administration. Oh, crap. Oh, that's not good. Well, shnikes. That does not feel good now. Now, what do you mean we had defeats? I'm literally raiding off the coast. That's not defeat. Now I'm training. Uh, let's see. Uh, you guys. Uh, yeah, you could use that. Yeah, I don't know, man. I really don't know. Let's get some more, at least some more naval XP. You know what? Let's do it on both sides. Train everyone. I wonder how much fuel we can use up in a, with, uh, with our entire navy. Oh, we're going to lose it fast. Current consumption, 14.6 a day. Max consumption, 68.7. 
Uh, we're currently get 12.9 every day, so that's fine. The two-party system. The National Progressive Party is growing in influence and popularity across the nation, and is increasingly seen as a viable alternative to the decades-long Republican-Democrat dominance of American politics. Through, though the MPP is on the rise, they could certainly be made to rise a little higher. If, for example, some government resources were sent their way while without anyone being any the wiser. Alternatively, we could assure up the support for the RDs instead, and hope that the NPP's rise is nothing more than a peaceful passing fad. Nevertheless, whoever we choose will have a bigger chance of winning this race to the Oval Office in 64. Ooh, ooh, um, hmm. Oh, man, I'm not really sure. I think I still want... Oh, I, I really don't know. You know what? I'm going to end it here, then, because I need to figure out which party the person I want to win the next presidential election is in. So, I hope you enjoyed today's episode, guys. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I'll see you tomorrow when we're going to have a lot of fun with the rest of the Nixon administration. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.